So, um, hi, my name is Justin Atsuara, and I did my research on random number generation by computers. And a common mis misconception about randomness is that it means that you can predict something about like a sequence of numbers, like if you flip a coin four times and they're all heads, then you should be able to know since the coin is random that tails is going to be more likely to come up next. So uh, that's actually not true. And the definition of randomness is actually complete unpredictability, which means that no matter how much you know about a sequence, how many numbers you have, and how much computing time you have, there's going to be no way to know which number is going to come next. So if you're like generating sequences of coin flips, they're they might be all heads, it's completely possible. There's no way of saying, I know for sure that this is going to happen with this, cer with this certain sequence. And a problem with having computers generate random numbers is that, uh, by definition, computers have to follow instructions. What they do is they take input, and then process it, and then spit it out based on that processing. And they process using instructions that usually like a programmer gives them. So there's no way to really give a computer an instruction to generate something random because there's no, uh, there's no process that actually generates something that's predictable if you instruct the computer to do it, right? So this makes it really, really hard for computers to generate truly random numbers. And so what we have instead are called pseudo-random number generators. And they're called pseudo-random because they're not actually <coughs> random. And pseudo uh, in Greek means fake. So uh, yeah, when we have pseudo-random number generators, there are a couple of properties of them. One is a pseudo-random number generator is period. And by the way, these are all completely predictable because they follow set instructions. So if you have enough information about a pseudo-random pseudo number generator, then you should be able to predict what it outputs uh, to a certain extent. So every pseudo-random number gener generator is periodic, meaning it periodically it repeats itself. It's like any other periodic function, like a sine wave or cosine wave, or, um, or any other periodic function, right? So. Uh, this period might be really long to to humans, right? But that doesn't mean that it's impossible for a computer to manipulate this period. So even if the period of a random number generator is like two to the to the thirty-two, which is like four billion, enough computers could uh, crack up pseudo random number generator with that period in a relatively short amount of time and manipulate it using that. Because if they know like all the numbers that it's seen so far and they know it repeats every so often, then they're going to know what it outputs and when it's going to output a certain sequence of numbers. So, uh, also, when, when you're looking at sort of random number generators, you look at the distribution of values uh, that it gives, because uh, usually when something's random, and especially across like, a huge, huge sequence of like, billions of numbers, uh, then there are going to be ways to predict like, what, what kind of values it's going to output, and they should be all even. So, like, every, if you're making a binary sequence of numbers, then there should be about an even number of zeros and ones. And every two-digit uh, two two sequence, like 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and 0, 0, all of those should be also evenly distributed throughout the entire sequence. So, also, uh, right, so now we, uh, we can look at a couple uh, examples of pseudo-random number generators. One is called the linear congruential uh, generator, and it's based on this mathematical concept called linear congruence. And basically, every every number is the last number times an, times a variable called a plus another variable called b modulo m. And all those uh, variables are chosen by the computer so that so that the numbers generated meet these certain specifications. And uh, there is another generator called the Mersenne twister, and the Mersenne prime is a prime number that can be expressed as two to the n minus one, and that's the only reason it was named that because its period is a Mersenne, a Mersenne prime, and it basically takes a bunch of variables, about ten of them, and it makes a jet, it generates a matrix out of all of these numbers, and then extracts a pseudo-random sequence based on a sequence of all those matrices that it makes, and. So we can look at uh, both of these and evaluate how they meet certain standards of, of uh, pseudo-random number generators. So if we look at the period of the linear congruence generator, it can be up to uh, the m, uh, the variable m, which is the variable that we reduce it by um, modularly. And 
that means that if, as long as you choose a really high value for m when you uh, program this generator, it should be really, really hard to, uh, to predict or to, to manipulate this random number generator uh, by just going through every number that it generates and seeing when it repeats itself. And also, uh, when, you, when you generate the other variables, a and b, right, it'll also produce really good statistics for, um, for the distribution of all its values that it outputs. Um, but a, a real problem with this is that uh, since, since each value is just a function of the value right before it, it makes it really easy to predict when you don't want those values. And uh, we can also look at the Mersenne, Mersenne twister. And uh, like I said before, its period is uh, Mersenne prime. In this case, uh, it's usually implemented, implemented with a really, really high uh, Mersenne prime for its period. In this case, it's 2 to the 19937, 19,000 <laughs> minus 1. So that's really big. And it's basically impossible for any number of computers to generate that many numbers to see one repeats itself. So it makes it really secure. And the reason it's important for uh, for all of these is that, uh, for for one thing, if you know that its period is really short, then you can just make a table of all, all the values, and then you can look at all these uh, applications of random number generators, like video games or cryptographic keys, and you can predict like what kind of keys uh, these people are using to encrypt their data, and then intercept their messages, or you could like manipulate a video game to like win, right? So. Another another thing is the distribution of values, and obviously, if you can know like one of these values is going to for sure show up more likely than the other, then you can manip manipulate that to your advantage, like betting on a certain number if you know it's going to come up more often. And uh, so there are a number of ways to fix this. There are these things called uh, cryptographically secure random number generators, and they're called cryptographically secure because. Um, because they're secure for creating cryptographic keys. And that means that if you, uh, if you know any amount of information about the sequences that these generators make, you won't be able to predict what it's going to output next, no matter uh, how many parts of the sequence you have, uh, or how many computers you have, like I said, you won't be able to predict it at all. And uh, so the way it does this usually is by using some kind of math function that's really easy to do forward but not backward. So that way, if you have all this output that's gone through this forward function, then you won't be able to undo it and see what, what's going on inside the actual generator. And another option is hardware random number gener generators. And they, they operate by just taking input from some part of the computer that's supposed to operate randomly, taking some data about it, and outputting based on that. So uh, one of, uh, sorry. One of the flaws with like cryptographically secure random number gener generators is that is that it's really inefficient. An example is Blum Blum Shove. So it's called Blum Blum Shove because it was named after uh, two researchers named Blum and Shove. And the way Blum Blum Shove works is that uh, first it creates its seed by oh its seed by the way is the starting value, and so it creates its seed by taking a uh, pseudo-random number from some other generators, squaring that, and then uh, and then reducing it modulo n, where n is some really big number that's the product of two huge primes. So uh, it's really efficient to take all these huge numbers and do, the, do these math operations with them. So it's usually uh, not used for things like, like games. And it's reserved for use with people who have a lot of resources and people who like uh, really want to secure their their random sequences. And uh, another thing is that it, it's based on, like the security of this generator is based on the difficulty of, of uh, factorizing this number n, which is, like I said, the product of two primes. So right now it's really, really hard for us to, uh, to factorize these huge numbers. But if there's some kind of advance in mathematics or computing that allows us to solve this within a reasonable time, then all of these people who generate their cryptographic keys or other secure stuff uh, using Blum Blum Shop won't be able to trust the, uh, the security of their data anymore because they know that someone can like, look at what kind of keys they've been making and use that to predict uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of output the generator is going to produce later on. So uh, another, another flaw in the hardware random number gener 
uh, an example of that is one that Motorola has used in the past that was presented at a conference in like 2002. So uh, what it does is it takes two oscillators and for one of the oscillators it runs, uh, runs that from that uh, through some, some kind of process and it takes the data from another oscillator and runs that through another linear process and from that it generates a single random number and it keeps doing that over and over and over again. So at first it looks like this is completely random because you can't predict how these uh, mechanical oscillators are going to uh, function exactly. But a problem with that, uh, with this random number generator, is that when when you look at like all the possible states of these processes that take in the input from the oscillators, it's a limited number of states that these uh, processes can have. So if you like, if you look at enough of these uh, these samples <coughs> that generator, then you can. Uh, put all the data into like a system of equations and then solve solve to determine how many possible states there are and determine what kind of output the generator will produce in the future given enough data about its sequence in the past. So there, there are a lot of ways to exploit this. One of them is in a video game like Pokemon. Pokemon implements a random number generator that's a variant of the recent twister. So its seed is based is based on things like time and date, uh, what kind of keys you press, and uh, other cryptographic information, and the MAC address of whatever console you're playing with, usually the DS, but also the Game Boy Advance, things like that. So all of these are things that you can determine uh, just with a little bit of time. And you can actually manipulate the time and date uh, on your console, set it to whatever you want, and you can mani manipulate what the random number generator outputs based on that. So. Uh, there's there's this thing called the frame when when you're in game, and the frame is basically a set of uh, variables that's really constrained. So in one frame you can catch a certain set of Pokemon, and in another frame you can catch another set of Pokemon. And so the random number generator is really really crucial for de determining what frame you're in, uh, along with another uh, set of informa information that's really easy to manipulate, like uh, movement and stuff. So if you can manipulate the random number generator, then you can uh, do things like catch the Pokemon that you want, catch shiny Pokemon, which are really, really rare, and you can also make them, uh, you can also catch Pokemon that are stronger, they have like better attack, defense, speed, uh, so this is really advantageous for the player, because if you can get stronger Pokemon, and if you can spend a lot less time uh, getting to this point, then you'll have a real advantage in battle because Pokemon is based on getting strong pets and then making them fight against other people's pets until they faint, right? So if you can, so if you can get really strong Pokemon uh, within a reasonable amount of time, then you can like get advantages in, in that. And you can also have a lot more time to experiment with different combinations of Pokemon, right? So you won't have to spend all this time, uh, especially since the Mercent Twister is designed to be really, really equally distributed in its values. It's going to take a lot of time to get to the specific Pokemon you want if you play fairly. So another possible application of this is, or exploitation of random number generators is uh, in gambling. So a lot of gambling is based on random events like poker and roulette. So when you're playing like roulette, it's just you spin a wheel and there's a ball and there are 36 sections and you just bet on a section and if it lands on that section then you win a certain amount of money. So in like a real casino, this would be completely random because an actual person would spin a physical wheel and you wouldn't know uh, where the ball would land. But if uh, you're like a casino company and you want to start this online service, then especially if you're new in the business, you might not know like these random number generators aren't actually random. And so you'd use like the linear congruential generator in your game and then people would see, see the code or maybe they might not even see the code, they would just like test your game and see what kind of stats it has. And they would see, oh, this casino is using a really insecure random number generator, so we should exploit this. And then they can run all these tests and take all this data. Uh, and this is really a small investment for people who are looking to exploit the game. And they'll see, okay, now we know every single number that the, that the roulette wheel is going to land on forever. And then you can just keep on betting and bang and winning all of these uh, winning all of these roulette bets and then you can exploit money uh, exploit the game based on that. Another another thing is poker. So poker is just dealing random cards to people 
and whichever player has the best set of cards wins. And so you could look at the random number generator the same way you would do with roulette. And this is actually a little more harmful than, uh, than just betting on roulette and, and exploiting that. Because when you win in poker, you actually take money from other people and they lose. So when, if, if you're playing roulette and you're cheating at roulette, then all you're doing is taking money from another company and you might have <laughs> enough money to like deal with this one person cheating. But if you're like playing poker, then all these other people are going to be like, wow, I keep losing and I can't win because uh, all these hackers are here playing. Right? So, so they're going to be really, really angry that they lost their money and all these people are going to uh, suffer harm from this. And not only that, but all these people are going to see this site's really bad so they're not going to play poker there anymore. And in turn, the site's not going to get any more money. So when you uh, exploit games like poker, then not only does the company lose, but the other players lose out also. And a really important uh, exploitation of random number generators is with cryptographic keys. And this is arguably the most important out of all the possi possible exploitations. So when you're using uh, cryptography to, to send information, it's obviously because you want to keep it secret. And you don't want anyone else to keep uh, to keep logs of what you're doing or to know what you're sending. So, uh, if you're like the military and you say to like another base somewhere else, the nuclear stockpile is here at these coordinates, and it's uh, here's the password to the whole stockpile. Then you don't want like Brazil. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't want Brazil to know where to look for your nuclear weapons and like nuke the whole world. So it's really important to secure this kind of information. And uh, when you're when you're working with cryptography, you use what's called a key to to specify how exactly the information you're sending is going to be encrypted. And a problem with uh, with this is that if you use the same key for too long, then eventually someone might find out. The longer you keep it, the longer the window of time is for someone to find out what kind of key you're using. So a solution to that is to use a new key every time. And it's really too easy to use that using a random number generator. And uh, a problem with this is that if you use a really insecure random number generator, then people can still see what kind of stuff you're saying because they're going to know what the keys you generate are. So. A really uh, good example of this was an early version of SSL that Netscape used uh, in the 1990s. They used a number generator that wasn't secure, and people knew that it was seeded. The initial state was based on just the time and date. So uh, people looked at the time and date, and uh, they, were, they were able to use this to determine what kind of keys SSL was using. And some students just broke this, even though uh, supposedly this was supposed to take an impossible number of years to break. So uh, if you look at uh, the ways that we can exploit random number generators if we're not really careful about it, and if we don't know how exactly to secure, to securely generate random sequences, then we open ourselves up to a lot of uh, possible exploitations. And uh, what we can kind of glean from all of this is that uh, efficiency and and security are kind of antithetical to each other. If you increase security, then it's going to be a lot less efficient. With the example of like Guam Dong Chub or Harbor Number Generators, which uh, which you can't really you can't really make them work faster because hardware operates at at kind of a set pace. So if you want to make something more secure, or if you want to make something more Sorry, if you want to make something more efficient, then you're going to have to sacrifice security. You're going to have to be able to let your random sequences be more predictable and take the risk of someone like snooping on what you, what you sent to other people, or you take the risk of people manipulating your, your game to gain unfair advantages. And another thing that we can learn from examining these is that uh, every, time we, every time we learn something more about security, especially in the field of pseudo-random number generators, it only makes things less secure. Well, it, it doesn't only make things less secure, but it can either make things more secure or less secure, depending on which, uh, which kind of research it is. So an example is like really, really early generators are really simple. An example, like I didn't cite this in my essay, but reading through, there's this thing called the middle square algorithm. And you start with this number that's a few digits and you just take the middle number and you square it and that's your random number. 
So uh, obviously people knew really quickly that this would repeat itself uh, really easily and it wasn't very secure. So uh, when we knew that that wasn't secure, that pushed people who were interested in security to do research and they made things like the linear congruency generator. And that was okay for a while and that's actually still the most widely implemented random number generators for most programming languages. But it's still really, really easy to uh, exploit when you're using it for things like cryptographic keys. And uh, that's true especially because of how, how low the period is. Like with the LCG, the linear congruential generator, uh, its equation is uh, the last number times a plus b modulo m. And its period can only be as high as m. So there's that implicit limitation with the way it's implemented. So uh, people knew that this was really easy to, to man manipulate by just generating a huge table of sequences and seeing, like, oh, we know this repeats after a certain number of tries, so we're just gonna, gonna predict based on that. So what came after that eventually was the Mersenne Twister. And Mersenne Twister wasn't a direct response to the flaws of the LCG, but it was definitely a development. And it increased the period to 2 to the 11 or 19,000, which is like, who knows, right? <laughs> so, so people saw that and, and they thought, wow, this is really, really good. But the people who wrote the paper and actually invented this, the Mersenne Twister, they admitted that it wasn't cryptographically secure. They said, well, if you know like 624, that's the exact number of consecutive elements in the sequence, then you'll know uh, exactly what kind of, what numbers it's going to output uh, infinitely. So uh, what we also have are things like CSPRNGs, cryptographically secure PRNGs, and uh, these work based on math operations that you can't reverse, like I said. So uh, these are really uh, what we, the best thing we have right now. And a problem with something like Lum Lum Chub still is that if you know the initial seed, then you know what it's going to output uh, for any arbitrary length of sequence. So uh, after CS, uh, CSP RNGs, we, we had the development of hardware RNGs. And uh, people, people thought these were secure. And then that just pushed hackers to like examine these. And they found that you can really easily, easily predict what kind of output hardware RNGs are going to produce also. So uh, it, uh, looking at all these things really leads us to interesting conclusions about security, that we can't really have security and efficiency, and that uh, no matter how much we develop, there's always going to be more to learn, because once you develop one way, the other side is going to take another step forward as well. Thanks. Is it viable to combine some of these pseudo-random number generators? Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. So, like the generator Blum Blum Chub, which is cryptographically secure, it actually takes a seed from another random number generator. Yeah? Can you remember my iPod? Thank you. Here, what iPod? So, Justin? Yes. So, uh, how... This, and this is a hard question, but, but uh, uh, how random do you think it has to be? Okay. Well, let me ask you another question. So the, the roulette wheel, okay. So, so, so you said the mechanical one is, is very random. Well, nothing's perfectly random, right? I mean, there could be, yeah, there could be dust in, inside the, uh, right. in the bearing. So, uh, yeah. So, any idea? This is, yeah, um, this is an open-ended question. So, so, okay. Well, with, with security, like any question of security, I think it's whatever you need is just however much is more than what we can exploit. So okay. with like a roulette wheel, yeah. yeah, if you took like a really high speed camera and looked at the exact way that the hand twisted the wheel, then yeah. you could calculate exactly where it would land. But no one, no one can do that with their resources right now. Right. And anyone who can do that isn't going to be spending their money playing roulette, right? <laughs> so we, <laughs> we know that it's basically impossible for us to do that. Uh, to exploit physical roulette wheels, so uh, that's secure enough. And uh, that that's not like universally true. So once we find some cheap way to like predict based on like a camera how a roulette wheel will land, 
then then it won't be secure anymore. And then we'll have to find some way of like making it more secure. So, and any physical process is actually not completely random. Like rolling a die, you drop it a certain way, and just physics works, and the dice land. So you can predict where the dice will land to if you like take enough time to roll a certain way or something, or examine how the dice are being dropped. So you ever try to walk into a, a, a casino in Tahoe with, with a high-speed camera? Um, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, did you come across anything indicating how to measure randomness? Mm -hmm. How to measure randomness? Yeah. Uh, there are there are a lot of heuristics for uh, for evaluating uh, pseudo randomness. Like the exact definition of randomness is just unpredictability. Right. So actually, a comic strip I read from Tilbury, they took him to the accounting section of his company, and the guy's like, "Here's your." Here's our random number generator, and it's a guy sitting at a rock table going nine, 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 nine. <laughs> and Gilbert said, are you sure that's random? And the guy said, well, with randomness, you can't really tell. So for true randomness, I don't think there is really any way to say for sure, right? But for pseudo-random number genera generators, uh, yeah, there are things like, I mentioned distribution of values, so every value should be equally likely. And in practice, you should be able to see that, with the exception of a few like anomalous test scenarios. And another thing is like period, the period of the generator, how often it repeats. And uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you very much.